Welcome to the Guild Family Stream. Brethren in Christ, loud day to Jesus Christus in sequela. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Happy November, everybody. It's a great day to be a Catholic. God is in control. Jesus is on the throne in heaven. And the church is triumphant and suffering and militant. We are blessed to be a part of the mystical body of Christ, to participate in the sufferings of Christ, anticipating his glory. Today, we cover the infamous case of Father Rupnik, the disgraced Jesuit who was expelled from the Jesuit order, but has since been incarnated. And now we have a new uh, surprise in this whole case, a uh, very surprise, a very surprising thing that uh, came from the Holy Father from the Vatican regarding this case. So we're going to be talking about all that in today's Guild stream. If you want the full Guild stream, you got to join the Guild community, meaningofcatholic.com slash register. This is the international community of Catholics fighting against the Marxists together as we together support each other and our families in passing down the faith in our time. This apostolate is dedicating to dedicated to uniting Catholics against the enemies of Holy Church. And the central part of that is invoking our lay patrons, which is first Mary and Joseph, and then St. Anthony of the Desert. St. Anthony gives us the example of a layman offering up his prayers and sacrifices for the clergy in a time of heresy. So that is the Guild community. So we the guild stream we offer together we discuss the topics that you suggest the questions and comments that you have about pressing topics and in particular the importance of having a community to bear one of those burdens and address things together so this particular topic is one that is rather dark and in order to do that we want to invoke our lady on this uh, into this darkness so that she can bring the light of Christ. So let's begin with an Ave Maria. Nomine Patri, Sibili, Spiritu Sancti, Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tua mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tua, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mate de ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre, Amen. In nomine Patri, Sibili, Spiritu Sancti, Amen. So the case of Father Rubnik has been called perhaps the most scandalous thing of the Francis pontificate. And this is because it gives all the appearance of that the, the, the bottom line attitude, the bottom line attitude of the Francis Vatican towards disciplining and stopping sexual abuse. The one word that summarizes the attitude that seems to be the prevailing attitude towards disciplining these wicked clerics is reluctance. That is the one word that comes to my mind when I look at the Rupnik case and many other such cases under the Francis pontificate, there seems to be a reluctance. Coupled with that is an indifference. And this is, very disturbing, something that disturbs our hearts when we are faced with such evil and such reluctance and indifference. And what we're going to discuss is an important take that we can consider when we look at this from an angle of someone that you may know that you may be surprised that I'm going to quote in this broadcast. So we'll get to that in a minute. But first, let's look at the spiritual side of this thing. We need to look at this with the eyes of faith. And it just so happens that I was doing my daily meditation that I do in, from this text, the School of Jesus Crucified. And this is, this is a reprint by uh, Tan of a 19th century Italian work, which was translated into English by Father Ignatius of the Son of Jesus, Passionist. 
And the text is has been very salutary for my spiritual life. And I certainly recommend it to all the viewers and listeners out there because it is, I've definitely found that meditating on the passion of Jesus Christ, his sufferings has been a, a salutary remedy for combating the evils of our day and, and addressing and facing them. And it just so happened that today's meditation is about the betrayal of Judas. So I just want to start by reading this and discussing the mystery of Judas. Because I think this is the mystery that God has given us. I, I do believe that our Lord, our King, has opened up for us this mystery of iniquity which sort of holds this key not for sort of giving us the giving us taking away the suffering but it does give us a way forward so let me just read this this is so this is um day two jesus is sold by judas iscariot judas having resolved to execute the unholy scheme which he had long been forming in his heart of betraying his master goes secretly to the high priests and the elders of the people and makes them the impious proposal of selling Jesus and of delivering him up into their hands. First consideration, consider who the man is who sells Jesus. Not a stranger, not disliked by, nor an enemy of our blessed Lord. No, one of his disciples, one of the dearest objects of his love, one of his intimate friends, one of the select band most favored by the divine master. How can we in any degree comprehend the deep grief, the bitter sorrow, the experienced by Jesus at such a return from Judas, whom he has always treated with such love and mild forbearance and on whom he has unsparingly bestowed the most signal favors. Ah, most bitterly does he deplore this enormous crime of which he has perfect foreknowledge. So the Lord Jesus Christ, in a mystery, chose these 12 disciples, of whom is Judas Iscariot knowing with perfect foreknowledge that his intimate friend would be his own betrayer to wound his heart in the beginning of his passion. The beginning of his passion is this betrayal of Christ. And it is in this mystery that I think we find this typology of the continual difficulties of the church. So Jesus, even though he would betray him, he chose him and he constituted the 12 apostles and he sent Judas out and Judas cast out demons and Judas did the apostolic work, we might assume. But in a mystery, there were two Judases. There was Judas Iscariot and Judas Thaddeus. Judas Thaddeus, St. Jude, the writer of the epistle of St. Jude. And the name Judas is obviously Judah, the tribe of Judah, the fourth son of Jacob, who becomes the firstborn son because the other firstborn sons, Levi, Simeon, and Reuben, lost their rights through their sins. And so Judah becomes the firstborn son of which Judah is the tribe of our Lord. Judah, the name Judah is what gives the name to uh, the Jews. The name Jews comes from the term Judah. Judah is the son of Leah and Leah gives, he, she names her first three sons based on sort of their, their sort of natural characteristics. But then her fourth son, Judah, Judah means to praise God. And so this is sort of this mystery where there are two Judases. And the beginning of our Lord's passion is the betrayal of Judas, which begins and causes the passion and causes 
the overthrow of the church of Christ on earth. Judas overthrows the church of Christ on earth on Good Friday. He is the cause. He begins this whole thing. Judas. And so this is this mystery that our Lord himself initiates and constitutes with foreknowledge, surrendering himself to this natural process in which Satan comes into Judas so that he, it is it is inverting his own name of Judas. Satan enters Judas who begins and initiates the passion. And so this is this darkness of the mystery of iniquity that our Lord himself enters into permitting his own sacred heart to be wounded much, much more deeply than his own enemies, his, his, his uh, Caiaphas and the Herodians and all these, these enemies who all, always hated them from the beginning. But as the Psalm says, even my own familiar who shared my bread has lifted up his hand against me. And this is the first wound into the sacred heart of Jesus. And so as we look at the difficulties and, and the these, these betrayals by clerics, we need to enter into the sacred heart of Jesus, enter into the suffering of his sacred heart at the betrayal of Judas and how much he suffers. And he suffers for our sake. He goes to suffer these things as a typology of our own sins that we have become Judas's. And what happens? He is he 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 causes the overthrow of the church of Christ on earth. The church is overthrown, Christ is dead because Judas initiated this whole process. And the resurrection. Christ is risen. Christ is risen for the dead, trampling down death by death. And against every expectation, God brings good out of evil. Judas destroys himself, and the 12 are reconstituted with St. Matthias. And so the gospel comes, comes out, and the gospel is spread. And so... This is the mystery of Judas, and this is the situation in our time that we need to look at this mystery of Judas. When we consider clerical sexual abuse, and we start with this mystery of Judas, we can address and face the evil in the church, knowing that Christ himself also faced the evil within his own church that he founded and he built. And he did it with perfect foreknowledge because he himself was omnipotent to bring good out of evil. And yet he says, it would have been better if he, Judas, had not been born. So there's this mystery of God's providence that he permits this evil to occur, yet says he shouldn't have even existed. Now, in addressing clerical sexual abuse, there is a balance between the Lord's protection of the innocence and the presumption of innocence. Because the Lord is the defender of widows and orphans and the vulnerable, and he will take vengeance against their adversaries. But at the same time, every man deserves a fair trial. Every man deserves by God's mercy, a presumption of innocence. And so balancing these two things is very difficult. But using our reason and coming up with evidence, as, as we'll talk about in the source that I will bring up, helps us to disentangle this. Now, a little bit about our current time. In my book, I discuss that our current time can be char characterized as the third pornocracy. There was the first and second pornocracy where the corruption of the Vatican, sexual, financial, moral, doctrinal, had reached its climax. And this was back in the 10th century, 900s. And it happened again during the Renaissance, 
1400s and 1500s. And each of these times, God brought good out of evil. You could read my book for more on that, City of God versus City of Man. And now we're entering into this third nadir of Vatican papal corruption. We just need to take heart that God can bring good out of evil, that God is the judge in these cases. But most recently, in our, in our own case, I think it's important to start with the 1978 investigation of the Vatican under, under Cardinal Edouard Gagnon, commissioned by Paul VI back in 1975. And this is where the corruption in the Vatican was unearthed, but there was no significant crackdown really until Pope Benedict. John Paul I was fortunately not reluctant, not reluctant, not indifferent to take action. But he died suddenly within a month of his, his pontificate. John Paul II, unfortunately, was reluctant. John Paul II was a great pope who did a lot of great things, but he was reluctant to crack down on abuse. Now, there's a reason for this that we've discussed. There's a, there's a reasonable explanation for his reluctance because we do believe that he was of good and great will. But part of this is because he dealt with so many false accusations from the communists, and that was the way that they worked. And so he was very reluctant to take in these same accusations. But after the assassination attempt of, of John Paul II, uh, Gagnon was able to call the shots later in John Paul II's pontificate. So he was able to crack down and crack a few heads. But the real crackdown began under Pope Benedict. And that is the immediate precursor, obviously, to our situation right now. Um, and that's what we'll begin with when we start the guild portion. So if you want the full discussion, go to slash register. Father Rupnik case, the infamous case, coming right up after this.